Have you ever wondered how the picture on a video monitor is formed? How does each dot of light know where to go? Why does a magnet throw it off its path? Each dot is the result of a beam of electrons landing briefly on the coated tube. The beam is steered into place partly by magnets. In this program, we are going to look at how magnetism and electricity are linked. Electricity was known to the ancients. They found that if you took a, um, something like this rod of plastic that I've got here and rubbed it vigorously on a cloth, it had an effect on s small objects like these grass seeds. I don't know whether you can see them jumping up there uh, or these bits of paper. Look at them all flying up to, 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 to stick themselves onto it. And that's the first demonstration of an electrostatic field. The space around the charged rod is called an electrostatic field. And over here, I've got a machine that, that saves me the bother of continually rubbing this rod. It, rubs, it does the same thing automatically, and it delivers the electricity to, the, to this metal ball on top. And if I switch the machine on, this metal ball will get charged up. And when it does, you can see the effect of the electric field is to is obviously spreading out from the, the top charged rod. If I put my hand somewhere near, I modify the field. But there's obviously an electric field in that region on top there. These two charged rods are dipping into oil. If we sprinkle grass seeds onto this oil, we can see them lining up. These seeds show the lines of force of an electric field produced by an electric charge. If we take the two static electric charges with their electric fields and make them move, the electric field will change its nature. It will transform into a magnetic field. It is convenient to treat magnetism as a force on its own, however it is well to keep in mind that it is really another form of electrostatic force. I get moving charges by making a current flow along this wire. This wire is connected to a battery and underneath it I've got a small compass needle. And Ersted discovered in 1820 that if you put a current through this wire, which I'm now going to do, then as you see, there's, it's, there's a magnetic field. The compass responds to a magnetic field. If I reverse the current in the wire, the, the needle points the other way. There's some a different effect going on around here, and that effect is known as a magnetic field. And we can take a look at the shape of the magnetic field in the next experiment. Now here we're hopefully going to show the magnetic field by putting some iron filings on this wire going through this plate. And I switch the current on again, and tap. And you can see the magnetic field produced by the current. Here's a magnetic field round the wires, and you can see it also round the connecting wires. These lines show the lines of force. These follow the direction that a North Pole would go if pushed by the magnetic field. In 1821, Michael Faraday carried out an experiment that showed this very clearly. He had a wine glass half full of mercury. A conductor carried a current and a magnet floated beside it. When he connected the battery, the current in the wire produced a magnetic field. This pushed the magnet around in circles in the direction of the lines of force.
a current produces a magnetic field. The direction is clockwise as the current goes away from you. It is easy to remember as it is the same as tightening a screw or corkscrew. As the screw goes away from you, it turns clockwise. Before we go any further, we should sort out the difference between current and electron flow. Unfortunately, the early researchers got it wrong. They thought electricity came from the side of the battery they had named positive. It wasn't until the convention was nicely established that they discovered it came from the negative end of a battery and had a negative charge. So current goes one way, but electrons flow in the opposite direction. So this is a current going from left to right. It's really made up of electrons going the other way. When an electron moves, it produces a magnetic field like this. All that referred to the field of a single, magnetic field of a single wire. Now, if I take a wire and then coil it up on itself, in this arrangement known as a helix, and the, the coil wound like that is called a solenoid, then obviously the magnetic field of all these individual turns in the wire will all be helping each other. And inside the solenoid, I get a very strong field. So if I switch on the current and sprinkle my iron filings over, over it again, you can see the strong field down inside the solenoid. There's practically no field outside at all. So a small current producing only a very small magnetic field can have its field increased a hundred times by having a hundred turns. We can confirm the direction of the fields with a compass. Outside the solenoid, the field goes in one direction. Inside, it points in the opposite direction. And this is the same with a long, thin solenoid. The field inside points in a different direction to the one outside. Let's look at a small segment of the field. The fields coming from inside here will head off to the right and point in this direction. But the fields from the outside will point in the opposite direction. They will partly cancel each other out. Let's see how this comes about. If we have one wire with the current going away from us, the field would be clockwise. A second conductor would be the same, but the two fields cancel each other out where they meet. They neutralize each other, leaving a field shaped like this. A whole row of conductors will produce a long straight field like this. Both sides of a solenoid will be producing fields. Looking first at the top half on its own, we can see the fields coming from the outside go in one direction and the fields from the inside go in the opposite direction. Now look at the bottom half where the current has reversed. The fields are the reverse also. If we put the two fields together, we find inside they reinforce each other. However, outside, they mostly neutralize one another. This is why the field inside is so much stronger than outside. We can see this in the patterns of the iron filings.
Knowing how a solenoid produces a magnetic field, we can work out what is going on in the center of the Earth. You may have to reverse your thinking in order to realize that the North Geographic Pole is actually the South Magnetic Pole. In the center of the Earth is a swirling charged mass. The molten core is spinning anti-clockwise. To produce the Earth's magnetic field, the mass must have a negative charge. You can work this out later for yourselves. The smallest electromagnets are inside the atom. Electrons move in a variety of orbits. And as they move, they produce electromagnetic fields. And it is these electrons that produce the magnetism of permanent magnets. These drawings are not to scale. The magnetic field comes from two movements. The orbit produces a magnetic field. The electron also spins. This produces a field of about the same magnitude, though often in the opposite direction. So when it spins and orbits at the same time, the fields can cancel each other out. The orbits in most atoms are more or less symmetrical. However, only in noble gases are they perfectly symmetrical and the orbits are completely cancelled out. Every other element is very slightly magnetic. For example, liquid oxygen, which is blue, is quite magnetic. So is copper sulphate. This weak magnetism is known as paramagnetism. Nickel, iron and cobalt are unusual. They are strongly magnetic. This property is called ferromagnetism. Unlike other atoms, these elements have one pair of electrons in one of the inner energy levels which spin the same way. Instead of cancelling out each other's field, the fields add together. In iron, groups of atoms line up so they're all spinning the same way, making quite large areas known as domains. They're up to a millimetre in size and can be seen under the microscope. They're lined up quite randomly, so iron is not a magnet when it is first formed. However, if we were to apply a very strong magnetic force to the iron, this would line up the domains to be north-south. If this is done as the iron is cooling from red heat, then it will become a permanent magnet. On the right is a magnet which attracts iron by temporarily stretching the domains into alignment. However, if we heat the iron, the domains will be shaken about until they become random again and magnetism is lost. As the iron cools down, the domains settle into line and it becomes magnetic again. The temperature at which magnetism changes is the Curie point. get a current in a wire in a magnetic field <coughs> there's a force on the wire and that is shown in this experiment here here is a wire it's not carrying a current at the moment I'm now going to switch the current on way look at that <coughs> I put it back again do it again so there she goes to work out the relationship between the magnetic field current and force on the wire we use the right hand palm rule Stretch out your hand with your fingers straight and your thumb pointing upwards. 
Your fingers point in the direction of the magnetic field and your thumb is pointing in the direction of the conventional current. Your palm is pushing in the direction of the force on the conductor. We can see how this works on the jumping wire. Turn your hand over so the palm faces upward in the direction of the force on the wire. So if the fingers point in the direction of the field, then the current must go in the direction of the thumb. The force on a moving charge is shown here. I've got this glass bottle and a stream of electrons travelling from the bottom upwards and it's arranged to impinge on the screen so that you can see where it is. I now bring up a magnet and you notice that the direction of the magnetic field is along towards the current and the current moves sideways. If I bring the magnet away and turn it round the current beam stream moves the other way. That's the sideways force of a magnetic field on a moving charge. This happens to charged particles such as protons coming from the Sun to Earth. If the Earth had no magnetic field, the particles would hit evenly all over the atmosphere. However, particles contact the Earth's magnetic field and are deflected. Those approaching the equator hit the field at right angles and are deflected away into space. Those approaching the poles find themselves trapped into spinning down the lines of force towards the poles. Here, the electrons in the gas molecules are disturbed, and we see this as an aurora. These two black coils on the outside produce a magnetic field when the current is turned on. The blue line is caused by a stream of electrons hitting the coated metal. By varying the strength of the field, we can control the direction of the electron beam. This is how a television monitor works. The copper coils are electromagnets that control a stream of electrons. In most TV sets, the control is by a combination of magnetic and electrostatic fields. They can accurately place the beam on rapidly changing locations on the screen at 16,000 changes per second. A television screen is similar to an aurora. When the electrons hit the screen, it glows. That is why we can undo the good work by placing a magnet on the screen. The electrons are deflected off their designated path and the image is distorted. This magnetic field detector uses the Hall effect to measure magnetic field strength. Imagine this is a conductor with a current. A magnetic field will deflect electrons to one side. With more electrons on one side than the other, we would expect a voltage difference. This difference is the Hall effect. The voltage should depend on the strength of the magnetic field. But when we try this with a metal conductor, it is hard to detect any voltage difference. Normal conductors produce a very low Hall voltage. The effect is far more pronounced in a semiconductor and this is how magnetic field strength is usually measured. The strength of a magnetic field is changed by almost any material. Iron increases the field strength dramatically. The iron bar becomes strongly magnetized. The solenoid with iron in the center is used in electric switches. Solenoids are used extensively where an electric current is needed to produce movement.
This is a loudspeaker. It is moving as we apply different currents. Inside, it has a coil of wire inside a magnet. When the current is turned on, it produces a magnetic field that is repelled or attracted by the magnet. By reversing the current, we can make the cone move back and forth. At higher speed, this vibration will send out pressure fluctuations we hear as sound. We define the magnetic field strength in the most obvious way. A charge of one coulomb, travelling at one metre per second, will experience a force of one newton if the field has a strength of one tesla. Or in another way, a conductor with a current of one amp in a field of one tesla will experience a force of one newton per metre per amp. The field strength is written as B. Now I've got two wires here, parallel, and they're both going to be carrying currents. And to start off with, they're going to be in the same direction. So therefore the first one's producing magnetic field. The second one is a wire carrying a current in a magnetic field. Therefore, this one should have a force on it from the magnetic field produced by the first one. I'll switch on the current and see. And now and behold, it does. And there's a force of attraction. The, wire, the current in the two wires is parallel in the same direction. Switching it on, there's an attraction between the two parallel currents. It is often quite difficult to predict how magnetic fields will interact. It is often helpful to see the lines of force as pieces of elastic. In this case, where the centre lines oppose each other, they cancel each other or annul, and the resultant field will look like this. If we imagine them as elastic, the wires would be pulled together. If the fields go in the same direction, the centre will be crowded. If we imagine them as elastic, they would push each other apart. This is the way Faraday imagined lines of force. We can measure the force on a conductor with a magnetic force balance. The current passes through a meter, through a variable resistor, then through a choice of five wires that pass around the outside of this balanced beam. At the end is a set of magnets. Their distance apart can be adjusted to vary the field strength. The current is set at one amp and then the beam is adjusted to balance. We note the position. Then the current is increased to 2 amps and the magnetic field from the wire doubles. The beam rises in the magnetic field and the mass is adjusted to balance it. Again, we note the position. Now we increase the current to 3 amps and the mass must be repositioned. And the same for 4 amps. then 5 amps. If we plot the current against the balancing force or the moment, we find it gives a straight line. So we could say that the force on the wire is proportional to the current. A nice, simple relationship. Now, here we have a rectangular coil. If the current goes down in one side, then it will be coming up on the other. Now, if I arrange a magnetic field across there, 
then obviously the force will be away from me on the one side and towards me on the other, just like turning the handlebars of your bicycle. So now I put a magnetic field across there. You see they, there's a torque, what they call a torque on the coil, and it just will go round. And that, of course, is the basis of the electric motor. If we look from the top, we can imagine the field lines. Around the wires are circular fields, and from the magnet are straight fields. On the other side of the coil, the direction of the circular fields is reversed. The fields interact. Where they are opposed, they cancel each other out. Where they are in the same direction, they reinforce. Again, if we imagine the lines as elastic, we can imagine the fields pushing the coil with a turning force called torque. This torque is used in the measuring of current in a galvanometer. The magnetic field comes from the horseshoe magnet, specially shaped to provide an even radial field. The current passes through the copper coil. If the radial field is even and the spiral spring long, then the distance moved will be proportional to the current. In this program, we've looked at how a moving charge produces a magnetic field. And how that magnetic field causes a force on a conductor known as the motor effect. We'll leave you with two puzzles. This is another of Faraday's experiments in which the magnet is fixed. Why does the wire move in this way when a current flows through it? And the second puzzle, what is the role of the commutator in an electric motor?